Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Aerospace Nation series. Now, even though Russia has captured the headlines recently, China is still our pacing threat. The scale and scope of their capabilities matched with an aggressive posture makes that real clear. For that reason, I'm really pleased to welcome our guest today, General Ken Cruiser Wilsbach. General Wilsbach is the commander of Pacific Air Forces, Air Component Commander for US Indo-Pacific Command, and Executive Director, Pacific Air Combat Operations Staff at Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii. A seasoned fighter pilot, General Wilsbach has flown 71 combat missions in operations Northern Watch, Southern Watch, and Enduring Freedom. So welcome, General Wilsbach, and uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, the last time that we spoke on this series, you'd just taken command of Pacific Air Forces. So I was wondering if you could share with our audience um, what you've been up to since that time. Uh, well, thanks, General Deftula. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here at the Mitchell Institute and really welcome everybody that's uh, joined in on the call. Um, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity for us in PACAP. And um, you're right, um, a lot has changed. And where I'd like to start is maybe what hasn't changed. And uh, probably the, the, uh, the aspect of the region that hasn't changed much is China. Um, China is still operating in the Pacific in many instances outside the rule of law and the rules-based international order. Um, they, they have incurred in uh, their neighbor's territory. Um, they've executed predatory lending practices. Uh, they promised uh, the citizens of Hong Kong that they would allow uh, democratic uh, principles to take place, and yet they outlawed that and um, basically um, used authoritarian measures to put their, their folks in power. Um, they've taken over uh, points in the South China Sea. They threatened to take over points in the East China Sea uh, and many, many other things. And then the, the most recent, I um, mean, you mentioned uh, Russia and Ukraine, but um, it's, it's really unfathomable that they would, you know, almost back Russia or at least provide uh, some sort of mutual support. Um, their, their talking points uh, here unconscionable, I think. And, and uh, so those are the things that haven't changed. But uh, the things that have changed, uh, we talked a lot about ACE last time. And uh, so we've expanded the, a the ACE envelope greatly in the last uh, year or so. And in fact, every exercise that we do now in PACAP has some element of ACE and even daily training. Uh, the wings out there are doing some measure of ACE employment almost every single day. And certainly their local readiness exercises, they incorporate ACE into that. And so the innovation that airmen have brought to the ACE capability is, um, is something that is new. There's many people that don't uh, believe in ACE and I, I, we may be able to get into Agile Combat Employment, ACE, sorry for the acronym, but Agile Combat Employment, there's people that don't believe in it um, because it's hard, but, but we can do that. Uh, we definitely can do it, and we are doing it, and it's it's an actual capability that we have in uh, PACAF. And then uh, probably the, the other really significant change is uh, is uh, Indo-PACOM commanders seize the initiative strategy. Um, so we've begun to implement this, and uh, I would say that uh, the differences that you would see from a year or two ago is um, more frequent uh, daily operations. And those operations are wholly integrated with the joint force. And so our staff in Hawaii um, integrates almost every day with the Navy, Marines, and the Army on those um, executions um, throughout the Pacific, mostly west of the dateline. And uh, we have an opportunity to execute our missions to demonstrate what U.S. forces can do in that part of the world. Well, very good. I appreciate that rundown in the context of like you say, what hasn't changed as well as what has. Um, let's jump into some of these points that you raised in a little bit more detail. Um, one of the ones that I think folks out there are really interested in is we've watched the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Uh, what do you think are some of the key lessons that the Chinese are taking away from watching what's going on? Well, first of all, I hope the biggest key lesson is 
the solidarity that the global community has, has really demonstrated in how they've come together when, you know, a very strong power conducts an unprovoked attack on a neighbor. Uh, and the international community has executed many, many things with um, sanctions and uh, diplomatic measures, et cetera. Aid, aid as well to um, Ukraine. And um, the international community has been outraged by what Russia has um, done, done to Ukraine and really put Europe at risk and, and others. And so um, I'm hoping that China will recognize that and realize that you know, something very similar, uh, you know, maybe even um, more robust would happen if they were to conduct some kind of unprovoked attack on one of their neighbors. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, the, the next um, lesson um, that, that I believe is how, how the NATO has come together like nobody else. And, you know, one of the talking points that, that makes me chuckle sometimes is how China accuses us of trying to put together a Pacific-like NATO organization. And we're, we're actually not doing that. Um, but, you know, some kind of unprovoked attack uh, um, inside of the Pacific, Indo-Pacific region you know, certainly would provide some kind of solidarity for the nations of the Pacific to come together and oppose um, something like that. So another um, lesson that, you know, organizations, whether they're, you know, um, very um, prescriptive like NATO or, you know, even ad hoc kind of organizations that come together for the purpose of uh, current events, you know, either one of those, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the, the Chinese uh, will, uh, will pay attention to. The other, the other aspect is, how difficult it is to do what the Russians are trying to do. And we're seeing militarily, you know, what, what um, roadblocks and uh, hurdles they've had to overcome and haven't been as successful as, you know, we anticipated um, the, what, what China would have to do and some of theirs with the terrain that they have um, uh, to, to contend with uh, around where their neighbors are at um, is something else that they should consider um, is th that it's very difficult to, conduct an invasion and to uh, achieve the military objectives and perhaps they might not be ready to do what they would want to do and the in immense cost that russia is incurring to do this uh, from national treasure from the lives that, that they have um, they, they have used up they've killed so many of their own people as well as um, those in ukraine and i'm hopeful that china will pay attention to that as well no, that's very good. A bit of a follow-up. That was we, what your thoughts in terms of lessons that the Chinese may have taken away. Um, does what's happening change the way that we think about deterring and, if necessary, defeating a, a, a Chinese uh, incursion, if you will, on uh, Taiwan? I don't know if it's really changed uh, the way we think about it because the foundation of um, our deterrence is readiness. And one of the things that I hope that China pays attention uh, to PACAF about is our readiness. And so a, a agile combat employment is, is one of those areas because we present dilemmas for them that we don't think that they can solve. But that's just one example of presenting dilemmas in the event that, you know, we, we do have a conflict with them um, that they haven't thought through all of the solutions um, or come up with solutions to be able to counter what we can do. And so readiness is the foundation right. of our, our deterrence. And that's, that's the Pacific Air Force's viewpoint, but really it holds true for uh, my fellow component commanders as well in the Pacific. Very good. Now, question on capacity. Um, you know, we really only have, and you know this very well, we only have about a hundred at any one time, operationally available F-22s, about 150 or so operationally available um, F-35s, 20 B-2s of which less than 10 are available at any one time, uh, and a limited number of increasingly hard-worn hard -worn, uh, C-17s. Um, so clearly we face some major capacity challenges. And then if you look at the expanse of the Pacific, uh, that takes an already small force and dilutes it further. Um, could you talk with the audience and us a little bit about how that impacts your planning and, and kind of foretells where we need to be going in the future? 
you bet. So the planning is based on what we have for the forces. And so the, the, the plans that we do, the assumption is that you're not going to get any more forces. And so that, that's, that's the basis of the plan. And so we, we, we plan and intend to execute the plan in accordance with the forces that we have. That being said, the plan would be a lot more robust if we had more forces available to us, um, you know, speaking to that capacity that, that you talked about. Um, and one of the one of the aspects of a fight that uh, that could unfold with China is their ability to defend their nation is very robust. Um, so they have implemented anti access area denial um, along the coast uh, of eastern uh, eastern China, as an example, also into the South China Sea. And one of the aspects that that we could stress that is with numbers. Um, and especially if you have attritable numbers. Um, so if you had um, either decoys or unmanned aircraft that could cause them to have to defend themselves because they're not exactly sure what that airborne asset is and they'll shoot weapons at it and they use up their weapons, um, that mass that you, know, you try to um, employ against them could, could give you an advantage because they use up their resources shooting things that you don't care that they shoot right. down. Um, so that would be a that would be a capacity that I'm very interested in as we go into the future is being able to amass um, targets for them to shoot at that th those ones we want to shoot and then the ones that um, follow that I mean, could be um, air power or munitions that are going to create the effects that we so choose. Yeah, no, very good. I mean, that's one of the areas that oftentimes doesn't get attention during peacetime. That's munitions accounts, right? Um, because they're not being used, but then when you need them, uh, you, you, you need them right away. That's right. Uh, so munitions is extraordinarily important. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, uninhabited uh, vehicles. Uh, Mitchell's issued several reports on that topic. We've got one coming out here shortly on autonomy and artificial intelligence that I think uh, you and the audience will find extraordinarily uh, uh, interesting. But where should we head now? If we look at the, the airplanes of the future, B-21s and continued buyout of F-35, um, what should we head for? Uh, should we work for greater inventory sizes of those types of aircraft? Yes, absolutely. So I would, I would say that being able to amass forces and to have some of them be attributable um, not not every time, but if you lose a, an unmanned aircraft or an uninhabited aircraft, it's a lot less meaningful to us than one that's manned, of course. Um, and the, the uh, choice that we have to make is how exquisite do we want these um, unmanned aircraft or uninhabited aircraft to be? Uh, so we can make them you know, as exquisite, say, as an F-35 or even an NGAD, uh, but the cost of that would be um, almost unobtainium. Um, and, and what I would advocate for is uh, make the manned aircraft exquisite and the, the uninha uninhabited aircraft to be um, less exquisite, slightly more attributable, so that we can have more of them. And just like I talked about in the last question, now you amass forces, you give them a lot more targets to have to defend themselves against because all of these assets will have some kind of capability, whether it be a sensor, whether it be a, a weapons truck, whether it's a jammer, uh, and they should swarm as well. So they should talk to one another and collaborate, um, not only amongst themselves, but also with the manned platform um, that they're um, supporting. Some of them may be stealthy. Some of them should be not stealthy because if it's stealthy and they can't see them, then they can't shoot at them. So um, there should be a mix of all of this um, as we go forward to present um, many more dilemmas than they can handle at any given time. And what we've seen in exercises is when you amass the effects um, and we amass the number of weapons that are going after a particular target, um, they'll be able to shoot down some of them because, as I've said, they have really good defenses, but, but they won't be able to shoot them all down. And, and it's the, the weapon that creates the final effect that you're looking for that counts. And all of these unmanned assets are supporting the manned assets. Very good. Now, you mentioned uh, agile combat employment in your opening remarks. 
Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what's going on and kind of what are your biggest challenges? I mean, I, uh, one of them that we all anticipate, I think, is the fact that um, our airlift forces are already stretched. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're going to work from uh, add the number of distributed operating locations, right. you know, what does that say for our deficit, if you will, in terms of airlift capability too? But don't let me bias you just on yeah. the airlift piece, right? Because uh, everyone's interested in sure. in knowing more about the the whole agile combat employment piece. Sure, sure. So um, probably the biggest thing is in December we published the concept of employment. And we did that in collaboration with you know, United States Air Forces in Europe, USAFE, as well as Air Combat Command, ACC. Uh, and um, the, the bulk of that document um, tells the wing commanders that would deploy either into USAFE or into PACAF, you know, how we're going to execute ACE um, in the theater. Um, and it allows them to train to it every day. And, and also as they deploy into PACAF, what the expectations will be. And so that document has been instrumental in allowing everybody to get ready and be able to win when you get there. Sure. Um, so that's that's one of the biggest uh, changes that have happened uh, really early this year. And then, all, like I mentioned earlier, all the exercises in PACAP have, have some kind of um, ACE element. We just finished uh, Cope North out of the Guam cluster. We had uh, jets from multiple countries in 10 different locations around Guam, uh, and they were all doing uh, doing ACE iterations on a daily basis, uh, moving, moving assets around and uh, being able to command and control those assets as the exercise was unfolding. I would like to mention that Cope North um, also included the Japanese and the Australian um, Air Forces, and um, they are both very interested in, in conducting agile combat employment, um, similar to what, what we do. Um, in particular, the Japanese are really trying to um, expand their envelope in ACE, um, particularly on mainland Japan. And so that's um, really exciting uh, for us um, because we intend to do ACE with them um, in the defense of Japan if we ever have, have to do that. Um, certainly uh, Australia is a great partner in the region and um, they're um, not only executing ACE-like iterations themselves, but supporting us um, with some capability um, inside of Australia with that also. So that's, that's fantastic. You mentioned logistics and logistics absolutely is uh, one of the two things that are the most difficult aspects of ACE. The other is command and control in a, uh, in a communications contested environment. But, but I'll talk about the logistics um, piece to start with. So one of the ways that we're beginning to tackle this you know, issue with logistics is um, by pre-positioning. And so for the uh, 23 budget, there's quite a bit of money in the 23 budget when we finally get that um, to start pre-positioning equipment and uh, parts and supplies, food and water, uh, fuel, uh, those kind of things we're beginning to pre-position. And if you pre-position, then those are at least initially places that you don't have to have airlift going in immediately supplying parts and supplies and et cetera. Um, so we're going to have a very robust repositioning at numerous locations around the theater. Um, and then the other aspect is having enough tactical airlift to be able to get parts and people to the right place where, um, especially there's an aircraft that needs a, a maintenance action, uh, maybe needs a specialist and you need to get, um, you, a lot of times it's small line replaceable units uh, and you don't need you know, something as big as a C-17. And in fact, if we're relying on the C-17 fleet, uh, to do this, we'll run out of C-17s very quickly because at the same time we're be, we'll be doing ACE, um, there may be a NEO in sure. place. Um, there will also be um, force flow, uh, tip fit, we call it, uh, force flow that will be moving from CONUS um, out to the region, but the C-17s will be um, extremely busy. And if, if C-17s are relied upon to do ACE, you know, my friend General Minahan at um, Air Mobility Command will run out of C-17s, e even if you um, add in the allies and partner C-17s, uh, which we have in the region, you just run out very quickly. And frankly, you would, you would waste the capability because like I said, often it's just a line replaceable unit that has to go out to an island somewhere and you don't need a whole C-17 to take you know, one piece that's yay big. So uh, C-130s will, will be a, um, a big factor in this. Um, and um, our, we have one C-130 squadron at Yakota and they um, frequently do ACE. 
um, iterations at their wing and they participate in the, in the exercises as well. Um, but I've also been advocating for a few years for something even smaller than a C-130 um, because what we find is, like I said, one line replaceable unit, maybe a specialist or two uh, needs to go to a small island somewhere and something um, smaller that may, maybe could take an engine, uh, just big enough to take an aircraft engine and smaller items. Perhaps it might even be an unmanned vehicle um, from, the, from the crew standpoint, but have a lot of them. Um, remember back in World War II, the uh, C-47, there were so many hundreds and hundreds, thousands maybe of C-47s and they were all over the Pacific and they weren't fast, but they could carry a lot, right? Uh, and the, they, um, they tackled the logistics problem of the Pacific by having a lot of tails to put equipment in and move it and, and it got there you know, at 120, 150 knots, um, but it worked. Um, and we, we could have something like that for ACE where you don't have to have it going 500 knots, um, but we need a lot of uh, tail numbers uh, to be able to get the small bits of equipment and pieces um, to the various spots that we intend to employ from. So that's logistics. The communications is the other aspect of um, ACE that um, is pretty difficult to do, especially um, in the current uh, logistics infrastructure, or sorry, the communications infrastructure that can be fragile uh, to, to cut. And what I've been asking for and what we're working on and improving is a meshed rather than uh, network, but, but meshed, I mean, I think people can kind of understand the concept of many different pathways uh, to get the calm through. Um, kind of like your brain synapses, you know, if you, you give it, you get knocked on the head and you, you, you lose some capability in your brain, your brain figures it out and goes a different path. That's kind of what we're looking for um, with our mesh communications network, uh, that self-healing also, kind of like your brain, you know, you don't think about um, the synapses in your brain, it just happens. Same thing with this mesh network, we want it to be self-healing so that operators aren't working the comm gear, they're operating and they're figuring out how to create air power effects um, and executing those air power effects, not switching frequencies and finding out where the, where the comm can go through. So we'll have to rely on artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to do that. Um, but that if you tackle those two things, logistics and communications, um, ACE becomes a little more easily. It'll still a little more easy. Um, it'll still be difficult, but it'll be easier than if we struggle with those two aspects. No, that's very good. I think uh, as you were, uh, speaking there, I was also thinking about the unveiling of the next uh, national defense strategy. And unfortunately, because of the decline in the U.S. military's capacity over the last 30 years, we have devolved to only a one major regional contingency sort of strategy. It's becoming very clear with what Russia has done with their aggression in Ukraine and the potential of what China could do in the Pacific that we really, really need to get back to and reorient the forces to a two major theater of war strategy, which would require uh, additional numbers of, uh, of forces. Not something that's gonna happen overnight, uh, but clearly we're under capacity in the context of everything that's required to make uh, ACE work in two theaters simultaneously. Lift is one that's, that's huge. Um, uh, your point on an unmanned lifter is, 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 is really kind of interesting because it doesn't have to cost a lot of money uh, to be able to do that in, in quantity. Right. So uh, appreciate that insight. Um, and, you know, we don't have any large airlifters uh, in production right now. And then people talk about, well, there's craft, but craft aircraft are not going to fly into a war zone. No. So you're uh, doing what you're doing in the context of using 134, of which we have a lot, but we, we still need to, uh, to do more perhaps in the mobility arena uh, in so. the future than we have in the past. Let's do a bit of a segue still focused on uh, the challenges that you have with ACE and the Pacific. You talked about the defensive capability of China. Um, obviously, air-based defense in the Pacific is going to be huge, particularly yes. at these deployed locations. Uh, doctrinally, that's a mission that's traditionally assigned to the Army, uh, but nowadays we know that the, the Army appears to be more interested in developing long-range hypersonic missiles uh, and, and duplicating C2ISR systems for targeting and 
putting in place our own satellite architecture, but be that as it may, how do we address this issue of air-based defense uh, from an Air Force perspective, if the Army's not gonna, not gonna cover it, um, where, where is that? Where's air-based defense in the, uh, I know you can't speak directly to the 23 uh, budget, but where is it in your thought process uh, in conjunction with ACE and right. the necessity to protect our bases? Yeah, so for, first of all, I would say that this is a mission that uh, the Army has. They've been directed to do it. And so uh, I think we ought to ask the Army to do it, which is what, uh, what I have done, is asked um, the Army to um, help us out with base defense. Now, at our uh, very large bases like uh, Kadena Air Base and Anderson Air Force Base and uh, others, we, we do have um, either Patriot or THAAD. We've got b both in Korea. We've got them uh, both in other places. Um, and those, those are helpful uh, for base defense. But with the advent of um, newer uh, threats like maneuvering reentry vehicles, stealthy cruise missiles, and hypersonics, yeah. um, we, we, we don't have all the defenses that we would need to be able to do that. And when you th start throwing in the Agile Combat Employment bases, um, there's not enough Patriot and Thads to, to go around um, for, for all of those, those places. So I've asked the Army uh, to, to work on that for us. And what we actually need is something that's a lot more agile than a Patriot or a Thad because it takes um, several, several C-17s uh, or you know, one, one big ship to be able to move um, those assets around. So they're, they're movable and they're mobile, but they're not agile from the standpoint of it takes a lot of lift capability to move those assets around. Um, so what we actually need is something, it's probably directed energy, um, but we probably need something that is agile so that we can get after those threats uh, that I mentioned, uh, that, but it's small. So perhaps you can put it on the back of a, a small truck, move it by a C-130, get it out to one of those islands. And then you do have some capability against ballistic missiles, some that maneuver on their re-entries, also um, stealthy cruise missiles and um, the hypersonics. And so if we have that capability out at the, the spokes of the ACE, uh, ACE employment, as well as at the hubs, we're gonna be in a lot um, better shape. And you know, if I have a choice, uh, what I'd like the Army to do is put some more dollars into that base defense and less on the long range fires because I actually um, have access through Air Force Global Strike Command. Um, we have access to long range fires, um, but we don't have access to all the base defense that we need. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, and as you're talking too, I'm thinking of what was just in the news recently, and that's a Russian attack on the uh, training center uh, out there along the border with uh, Poland, they launched 30 cruise missiles and they managed to shoot down 22, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, eight got through. I mean, it just, it reiterates the importance of, uh, uh, of air-based defense, not just against airplanes, but against missiles as well. You bet. Uh, and if you don't mind me interrupting. Absolutely. But when when um, somebody shoots, say, 30 missiles at you and you shoot down 20 of them, those are 20 effects that didn't occur. And even if eight get through, you know, we, we have the capability to do rapid runway repair. And uh, we also have capability to get everything airborne when we know the attack is going to occur. And so you can recover from that. And But, but what's happened um, by the adversary is they've used up two thirds of their magazine if, if you can keep that up. And at some point they start running out of munitions. No, that's an excellent point, too, uh, because for years, I know uh, in my career and yours, too, um, we practiced operating under attack. Uh, and it's not like, OK, you come under attack and all of a sudden that base is negated. No, that's not true. Um, you get back into being able to operate right, uh, uh, right away. Now, as a, you talked about the ability to, to maneuver uh, defenses. Um, one of the issues that I can recall in my time as the warfighting headquarters commander out there in the Pacific going through several terminal fury exercises was operational control of the Aegis mm -hmm. capable cruisers and destroyers. And the question of who's got the final say so in terms of whether they might be used for defense of a particular location versus fleet requirements. Have you been able to work through that with your yeah. Navy counterparts? 
we have, and a lot of the audience might not know that one of my other roles is the area air defense commander, uh, which means I'm responsible for um, the ballistic missile defense of the theater. And uh, in that role, I negotiate and uh, communicate with um, the Army, with Patriot and Thad, as well as the Navy for Aegis. And uh, frankly, we're, we're not caught up in uh, um, who has OPCON of the asset or, or even who has TACON. Uh, we really operate on uh, direct support, um, especially with the Navy. Um, and so if we have an area that we need additional coverage by an Aegis uh, ship, uh, we talk about it and we move it around. And um, ultimately, the Indo-PACOM commander has um, the authority uh, over where the ship um, ends up. Um, but I've had really no issues with the Navy um, during my time in PACAF when we needed a ship uh, to, to be in a particular location, maybe because the Patriot or Thad was down, we moved the ship in. Um, and that, that creates costs somewhere else with the sure. Navy strategy. Um, but um, we, we seem to be able to work through direct support uh, pretty routinely, and it really hasn't been much of an issue. Great. Um, I talked a bit about the shift to a one more two war planning construct. I know that doesn't directly affect what you're doing right now, but have you noticed any difference in terms of uh, emphasis, if you will, or support given what's going on in the European theater today? Uh, well, I, I guess what I would say is it does actually impact us because it really goes back to your capacity question. Because when we went away from um, the, the two theater war simultaneously construct, we had a lot more forces right. then um, compared to now, and it, it, it directly affects our capacity. And um, as I mentioned last week in AFA, I'm, I'm watching China very closely during this Russia-Ukraine crisis because, and I explained this at, at, uh, at AFA, but the Chinese word for, for crisis has a connotation of opportunity, a dangerous opportunity. That's, that's kind of the way it translates. And so they look at crises um, certainly as a dangerous situation, but they also look for the opportunity in that dangerous situation. And so I ask everybody to keep a close eye on not only China, but also uh, North Korea, right. uh, which we've seen them shooting off um, ballistic missiles uh, since, uh, since this started. And so is that them taking advantage of the world's attention in Europe? I don't know. Um, but um, the same goes, holds true for China. You know, I'm keeping a close eye on where they might take advantage. Um, and what if they do? And we have this only, you know, one theater policy where we're going to be short on capacity um, if, if we would have to be in two places at the same time, which for a, a country of, of our size and um, stature, and we have interests all over the world, it's not unfathomable to uh, imagine that you might have to be in two places at the same time. No, that's very good. And for our audience, just to, just to remind you, and I know we've got a lot of Air Force people out there, but remember, in Desert Storm, we had 158 combat squadrons. Uh, and today, we have like 55. So we're one third the size that we were 30 years ago. And readiness wise, while not getting into specifics, we're significantly less uh, ready than we were back then. Um, so these are issues that really need to garner uh, the attention of uh, 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 the Congress and the American public. Uh, I, someone told me a statistic the other day where the Chinese pilots are actually getting twice as much flying time as US Air Force pilots. And I can remember during my career, we prided ourselves on having a training edge. Um, I think we still have a training edge, but hey, uh, hours in the cockpit mean something. So I, it just a, a little bit of reinforcing statistics out there for the mm -hmm. audience. Right. Um, now, clearly, fifth generation aircraft are going to become increasingly important in the uh, in the Pacific, and that really kind of opens our, the ap aperture when it comes to training and partnership engagement. Yeah. One of the cool things about the F-35, other than performance, is that we have 14 nations now that are operating the same aircraft. So now that our allies are gaining this capability, how does that change the way you think and plan about operating in the region? You bet. 
So it's great that uh, uh, the Republic of Korea has uh, their, their first 40 um, F-35As um, and they've ex expressed a desire to maybe get some more. Uh, Japan is um, still, still um, taking delivery on theirs, um, Australia as well. Um, and uh, Singapore has, has um, bought into the program. Uh, they don't have any jets yet, but they're, they're going to get some soon. Um, and there are others um, in the region that are interested, which I'll, I'll save for, for their announcement. Uh, but uh, what we do, especially uh, when we all get together in Hawaii, uh, like we did last fall uh, for the uh, Pacific Air Chief Conference, uh, we had a breakout session for all the F-35 users. And we spent the afternoon comparing notes. Um, and um, there's a wide range of experience with fifth generation in the room from the United States and Australia, um, and then the other countries who are really just getting fifth generation for the first time, um, and the ability to share the lessons learned. So as an example, you remember this, when we first got the F-22, we flew the F-22 for about five years like an F-15, till we learned you don't have to do that anymore, you can fly tactics uh, that are commensurate with fifth generation capabilities. Well, we've, we've shared with our partners who are buying uh, F-35s, you don't have to fly it like an F-4 or an F-16 that it's replacing, um, but rather you can do fifth generation tactics. And so they're not doing the five years flying old tactics, they're going straight in flying the newer tactics. And so that gives them a head start compared to what, what we learned when we first um, say got the F-22. Um, and uh, maintenance practices, so as you know, Taking, uh, taking care of a fifth generation aircraft is a lot different on the maintenance flight line than it is um, taking care of a fourth gen. And so teaching them um, those te uh, techniques of especially low observable maintenance and making sure that the most important part of a stealth aircraft is the stealth. Um, and if you don't take care of that, you've just spent you know, several hundred million dollars um, for a system that's really not that much better um, than a fourth gen platform. So low observable maintenance is, uh, is something that, that we talk about um, quite a bit. But then the other aspect of, you know, what could you do operationally if your allies and partners are joining you with, um, with their assets in a contingency or in a crisis or a conflict, and you, you have their fifth generation fleets um, at our disposal to be able to create effects. And, and um, that is something that you know, I, I think is our strength. It's almost our superpower. When you think about China's team and who's going to be on their team and the capabilities, you know, one, their team is really small, but what capabilities could they bring that, you know, would trouble us? Well, their, their team doesn't bring a whole lot of troubling capabilities, frankly. But, but if you look at it from China's perspective, what about our team? You know, our team has a lot of military capability and some of it is fifth generation, um, which if you're a military uh, planner in China, that should worry you because that's that's um, very good capability um, that can counter what they can bring to the fight. Oh, very good. Uh, uh, during the uh, back to China and Russia again in their relationship during the Beijing Olympics, uh, both those countries put out a joint statement indicating that they're ready to cooperate across a wide range of global security issues. Have you seen anything to indicate that there's substance behind this development or is it purely uh, political uh, posturing and just what would increased Russia Chinese uh, association do? How would it affect you out there in the Pacific? Yes, so as you know, we've seen uh, some integrated bomber patrols um, in the past where Chinese and Russian bombers along with their command and control aircraft and tankers have um, done very short exercises um, together um, through, the, through the Pacific. Uh, we've seen a few of those, not too many. I mean, there's been a couple of other exercises that we've seen them um, do together, um, but I, I would not say that they're interoperable um, in any way uh, and um, their systems are, are quite different. Um, it's interesting to see the power play. You know, China thinks that they should be the lead and Russia thinks they should be the lead. So I'm, I'm fairly happy with that tension there. Um, and I think that that'll be a problem for them as they, they go into the future. Um, so, but, but I think one of the, the really good news stories is we're not seeing interoperability in any way. But again, go back to what they see. You know, they see us flying with 
Republic of Korea and with um, Japan and Australia and many of the other countries, Indonesia, even India. We, we, we fly with them routinely, um, Malaysia, another one, uh, Singapore, another one, and we're interoperable. One, we're flying a lot of the same equipment. Um, we're even data linking together um, in some cases, and uh, the tactics are very similar, and we are quite interoperable um, with our allies and partners, and the, the Chinese really don't have that. Um, they don't have that capability. Do you see, um, you, you spoke a little bit about it in terms of joint China-Russia patrols um, in the air and at sea. Uh, do you see any further uh, acceleration in those exercises, or do you believe that the Russians are too occupied right now with what's going on to Ukraine with the Ukraine, uh, since they're actually now asking China for aid? Uh, do you see greater development in the exercise regime, or not so much? Uh, probably it'd be more in the category of not so much, and I, I suspect we may have seen more if Russia hadn't invaded Ukraine. Uh, perhaps we would have seen more, but I, I do think they're uh, pretty well occupied. Um, and I think that also uh, China um, may have been uh, maybe surprised by what happened. So we all heard Xi Jinping say, you know, before the Olympics, Russia wasn't going to invade, and then they did. You know, so I, I asked the question, what happened there? Yeah. You know, was was she wrong? Was he um, part of the misinformation campaign that Russia was putting out, um, um, or was he surprised? Was he duped by the Russians? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but you know, it certainly makes me wonder about everything else that she says. Uh, uh, but um, I, I think that China's taking a pretty cautious approach right now uh, based on uncertainty of how this might turn out and also the international backlash that's happened toward Russia, and they probably don't want to get caught up in that uh, too much. But it still is very surprising that they've come up with the support rhetoric that they have. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and obviously, uh, Russia, Ukraine is very different than China, Taiwan, as is the economic relationship sure. with the United States. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, now, before we head over to our audience for some questions, one more uh, and you talked about this pretty well, but uh, any other additional comments on the potential for uninhabited aircraft in the region? Uh, what about manned unmanned teaming? Uh, do you see value in, in, in this, uh, in addition to what you had to say about getting a more attritable aircraft into the fight? You bet. I, I think the, the manned unmanned teaming is uh, really the wave of the future, especially if you can have mass with the unmanned teaming. So imagine an NGAD aircraft um, that's out there as a maybe a two or a four ship, but there's 20 or 40 unmanned team mem mates out right. there, um, all with a, a package that can, can be agile from the standpoint of you can swap different kind of support packages on board those un, un, unmanned assets from sensors to jammers uh, to just a weapons truck. Um, to just be in a decoy, um, to just, just being the one that gets shot, you know, so that the other uh, teammates can keep going. Uh, so this, this, um, this idea of some of them can be a tr attributable so that we don't want to make these things so expensive that we don't want to get them shot. Right. We should be okay with them getting shot uh, or bringing them back. So they should have that capability, bring them back, use them another day. But if they get shot, okay. Uh, it wasn't that expensive right. and we saved a life and we saved a very exquisite, expensive platform. And so the artificial intelligence that goes along with having a force, you know, say 20, 20 of these things with four NGADs, there's a lot of technology that we still have to develop. Um, but um, I, I'm, I'm confident and, uh, and optimistic that we can do it. Oh, very good. And like I said, Mitchell Institute is going to have a report for you with some recommendations uh, to, to move forward in that regard. So thanks very much for those Thank insights. You. Let's uh, take uh, some audience questions now. Um, as always, when I call on you, please state uh, uh, your name and, and the uh, affiliation of the organization you're associated with. Um, let's start right off with uh, Mr. Uh, Steve Tremble. Steve? 
Hi, uh, Steve Trumbull, Aviation Week. Thank you very much uh, uh, for letting me ask a question. Uh, it's about um, the F-15s in PACAF with double Zs on them. You know, so for the 44th and 67th, uh, you look at those tail codes, they're, they're all in the 40-year-old type range in a pretty corrosive type environment. And I, I'm just curious what, you know, uh, what, what you want to see um, replace those and, and when um, those could be replaced. Um, and it just as I look at it, I don't see anything in the pipeline for F-35s or F-15EXs over the next three or four years. So you know, do you have any concerns about them hanging on and what do you want to see replace them? Um, so uh, thanks, Steve, for your question. And uh, I would say, yes, um, they are old platforms. And you know, having flown uh, those very jets myself for two different assignments, um, you know, I'm very proud of what they've been able to do over the course of the history that they've been at Kadena Air Base. And in fact, uh, General Deb Tula you know, brought some of those uh, original jets um, back in the day uh, there. Uh, and so um, there's a long history between the two of us here at Kadena. But uh, they, they are old and it is uh, likely time to get them replaced. And um, I've been advocating for the F-15EX. Um, I had a chance to fly the aircraft um, a few months ago and was extremely impressed um, with the platform and uh, what we intend to use it for there if we're so fortunate to um, get, get that replacement is um, air superiority and some long range weapons capabilities that you can uh, conduct on the F-15EX, if you put conformal fuel tanks on that aircraft, you're, you're taking off with about 30, over 30,000 pounds of fuel. You can stay airborne without a tanker for three or four hours. Um, so that gives you quite a, a range capability on the aircraft while you're carrying a lot of weapons. Uh, so you can take you know, 12, maybe as many as 20 missiles um, into the air. Um, you can put JASM on the aircraft. There's a lot you can do with it. It's very versatile. Um, and some of the weapons that we've got um, planned for the future that are very long range hypersonic weapons that you can't put inside of an internal weapons bay of a stealth aircraft, you can put it on the F-15EX. Um, so um, those are all things that we have uh, planned for the F-15EX uh, at Kadena. And um, ho hopefully um, as we um, unveil uh, the details of uh, future budgets, um, you, you'll be able to see some of that. Great, thank you. You bet. Okay, um, we just had a, a, a chat question here from John Turpak, uh, and it just, uh, well, there it is. How do you see the Chinese employing the J-20? Um, is it an airbase killer, an AWACS killer, or truly an air superiority asset? And what are you more concerned about, that or greater numbers of J-10s or Chinese AWACS? It's, it's a bit early to tell exactly what they intend to do with the J-20. So really all we've really seen it do is um, air superiority. Um, but what I will tell you is what we're noticing is they um, are flying it pretty well. Uh, we recently uh, had, um, um, I wouldn't call it an engagement, but uh, where we got relatively close to the J-20s uh, with our F-35s. Um, in the East China Sea and uh, were relatively impressed with the uh, command and control that um, was associated with the uh, J-20s. They also had uh, some other aircraft um, in, the, in the region as well um, that were um, pretty well um, commanded and controlled um, by uh, the Chinese um, assets. Uh, so we were seeing relatively uh, professional uh, flying and, and uh, so um, that, that's Really, it's still too early to tell exactly what um, they intend um, to do with it, whether it's going to be more like an F-35 that's um, you know, capable of uh, doing many, many missions or uh, more like an F-22 that's primarily an air superiority fighter that has an air-to-ground capability. So a little bit early uh, to tell. Um, what I will tell you, though, about their command and control, um, significantly the KG-500, um, is that plays a significant role. Um, in uh, some of their um, capability to be able to have long range fires. And so uh, some of their uh, very long range air to air missiles you know, are aided by that, that uh, KJ 500. And so being able to um, interrupt um, that kill chain is something that interests me greatly. Okay, how about Mr. Frank Wolf? Frank? Frank, you need to unmute. 
Oh, hey. Hi there. Um, yeah, um, I just wondered, uh, Navy officials, I guess, last, uh, I believe it was last March, <clears throat> including, I guess, Rear Admiral Harris, the head of uh, the Navy Air Warfare Division, had talked about a, a possible air wing, carrier air wing split of about, I think it was 40 to 60 um, unmanned to manned, and then maybe moving to 60, 40 um, <clears throat> manned, unmanned. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on the appropriateness of that for the Air Force in terms of um, you know, whether that was possibly the right mix. Uh, and also, obviously, you had mentioned earlier the the unmanned airlifter possibility. Um, so I just wanted to get any of your thoughts on that. And also, if you have time, just in terms of the unfunded requirements you have. I mean, obviously, you've spoken about the need for sort of wedge tail coming in the future, but just if you could address sort of what you really need right now that, you know, you don't have. Excellent. So I, I don't want to um, in any way judge or um, analyze or evaluate the Navy's um, uh, position on, you know, what they think their manned and unmanned percentages should be. Um, if, if you heard the earlier uh, question that I had about uh, unmanned, you know, I, I want m many, 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 you know, and so I, I would contend that, you know, a 50-50 split wouldn't be enough, you know, so I, I'd like to have multiple for every man uh, that we have, especially in inside of the anti-area access denial uh, region that China has put up for every manned platform that you have. I'd like to have multiple unmanned uh, platforms that could do a, a variety of different missions uh, for that manned platform. Um, so, I, I, and, and the Air Force has not, you know, put down a percentage uh, just yet on what, what that might look like, um, but that's certainly a study that we'll, we'll be doing, I'm sure, here in the near future. But just from, from what I know from air warfare and, and creating air power effects for the joint and combined force, I think we're going to need a, a lot more unmanned, uh, many of them attributable um, so that you can create the effects that you're going to be looking for. Uh, from the standpoint of um, unfunded requests, um, and I, I wouldn't say that this is totally unfunded, but you mentioned the, the E-7, um, but um, I've been an advocate for the E-7 for a while, and the reason is because our E-3 fleet um, it really struggles from a maintenance uh, reliability standpoint. Uh, we have four of them in PACAF, and, um, and oftentimes all four of them um, are not able to fly because of maintenance issues. And, and mainly their uh, basic issues, they don't have anything to do with the sensors on board the aircraft. It's electrics, hydraulics, and engines. Um, and it's just an old platform that, that is very difficult to maintain. Um, that, that's just one aspect. But when it gets airborne, those sensors um, that we rely on on the E3 aren't really capable in a 21st century flight, especially against a platform like um, the J20. Um, or something uh, similar to that. It just can't see those platforms far enough out to be able to provide an advantage uh, to the shooters. Um, and so that's why I want the E7 because it has quite a bit more reliability, a lot more reliability. And it also has a lot more capability with the sensors that are on board that platform. So that's why I would like to have the E7. You know, other things um, really have to do with um, air superiority. Um, so I would like to have fifth and sixth generation weapons married up to fifth and sixth generation platforms and to include our allies and partners. Uh, so for those countries that are buying the F-35, um, I wish them to have uh, very similar, if not the same weapons that we have um, that are capable of taking advantage of the fifth generation capabilities. And then the same thing when we finally get NGAD to have a a capability that is commensurate with those uh, sixth generation capacities. Um, there needs to be weapons that go with that so that we don't end up um, evening up the fight because we can't shoot until well into where you actually detected the threat because your weapon can't get there you know, from where you're at. So um, improving the weapons capability uh, would be a, a huge part of um, what I'd like to, to do. And then the last piece is don't slow leak the acquisition. So if we've made a decision to buy F-15EX and E-7 and the, the JATA missile and the HACA missile, those are all great capabilities and they, they would all be in, in the category of things that I would want. Don't slow leak it to the point where by the time you get them, it may be too late. You've got to acquire those assets very quickly. 
and, and you know, may, maybe even to the max extent that industry can, can produce them, um, but we've got to get them quickly and, and not waste time um, s s slow, uh, on a slow buy schedule. Thank you. Okay, okay let's go to uh, Mr. Sagman Lee. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, um, I have a question about North Korea. Uh, there has been a report that there will may be some imminent North Korea ICBM launch. So General, uh, can you tell me, is there any indication that North Korea prepared the launch ICBM? And related to that, uh, how is the uh, military readiness of Pacific Air Forces related to the potential North Korea ICBM launch? Yes, thank you. So um, I, I guess I probably saw the same open open uh, press that you saw on that. Um, and so I don't wanna confirm any intelligence um, information that I have at the classified level, but certainly we've seen um, at least two, uh, what looked to be like ICBM launches uh, by North Korea. Um, and further, um, a number of missile launches, even since the beginning of the year from, um, from relatively short range um, over to the medium uh, range. And, and, and so I'm interested in what's going on with um, that strategy uh, with uh, North Korea. Is this perhaps them uh, taking advantage of, of the world being um, focused on what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, or is it something else? Um, my friends in Japan, um, as well as in the Republic of Korea are very concerned about what's happening um, in, on the peninsula um, from the North with respect to um, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And um, certainly we in PACAF are, are ready, to spawn, ready to respond and um, are uh, prepared uh, if we get orders to do anything different uh, to be able to execute those orders. Okay, let's take a couple from the uh, chat room. Here's one from uh, Taylor uh, Heron. Uh, General Wilsbach, we've seen in Europe just how important information operations can be in countering disinformation. How are you thinking about that in PACAF? Are there lessons we can take from this to increase readiness in this area in Indo-PACOM? Absolutely, yeah, that's a great question, and we, we actually um, incorporate um, in, in, information into most everything that we do. Um, and um, what, what I, would, I would challenge the premise of your question uh, in that that's not really the best way to go about um, doing information operations by correcting the record, but rather set the record um, in, in terms of what you're interested in communicating um, up front. Um, so, so it's it's kind of the uh, the old the old adage is uh, the best defense is a good offense, right? So um, you get the message out that you're interested in, and you plan that up front before you even start any other kind of operation. You get your information uh, requirements set up front, and perhaps you release that information out into the the, the global sphere. Um, at the time and place of your choosing, and then follow that up with the operations. And that way you, you, you put the foundation um, out there um, so that the world sees your talking points, the world sees your, uh, what you want to communicate about um, what's about to happen, and then you execute it. And now you're on the offense, and now if the, if the enemy or if your adversary has you know, a different perspective, they, they have to correct the record and you know, first, first to the field there um, is usually the victor, and we, we all see that. Um, so that, that's how we're thinking about it. And then the other aspect of this is really making it much more robust and having um, much more capability. Um, and, you know, certainly the authoritarian uh, regimes out there have uh, somewhat of an advantage because um, they, they can keep uh, they can keep the uh, information environment pretty sterile and only, you know, their approved talking points get out and you don't have um, the freedoms that we enjoy and having um, other, other, other just individual citizens be able to um, be able to contribute to the, um, to the discussion, um, which I'm thankful that we have, um, but I'll just tell you, it's pretty easy for the adversary to, to shape the environment, especially up front. Well, unfortunately, General Wilsbach, we've come to the end of uh, this aerospace so nation series. <laughs>
and uh, thanks very much for yeah. taking your time to share thanks, your Jim, insights. I think uh, you face incredible challenges in the Indo-Pacific, and we're extraordinarily fortunate to have you as the commander of Pacific Air Forces at this time. So mm -hmm. thanks again for your time. Thank you. And from all of us at the Mitchell Institute, um, we wish you all a great aerospace power kind of day. <laughs>